Okay, I'm back for a quick review of excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscle. I'm going to start with a blow up of our neuromuscular junction and show you what happens from there. Here we've got our T tubule. Somatic motor neuron comes down the synapses with that muscle fiber. Remember, uh, uh, somatic motor neuron synapses with multiple skeletal muscle fibers. I'm showing you part of that skeletal muscle fiber cell. Same thing. Um, and the combination of the motor neuron plus all of the fibers it innervates is a motor unit. So this is would be part of a motor unit because it's only showing one. Uh, of the innervated cells. So I can show branch actually if you'd like of another one that would go off to another muscle cell uh, in another region. Okay, so when we get an extra potential here, we get neurotransmitter, which is acetylcholine released at the synapse. We have ligand gated sodium channels, so we would get sodium influx, which generates. EPSP, right? It's excitatory because it's a depolarization. Now, um, we just generated a local change in memory potential, and so that's going to lead to electrotonic current, just like it did in neurons. And so we would get electrotonic current outward from there. It would depolarize the adjacent membrane and the sarcolemma, the membrane of a muscle cell, uh, has voltage gated channels, sodium and potassium, right? So we're going to get an action potential. Now we have an action potential in the sarcolemma membrane and it travels along the surface of the muscle cell, depolarizing at every, at every spot along that cell. Now we don't really worry about depolarization out here, but depolarization at the T tubule is a big deal because that's where we have our adjacent sarcoplasmic reticulum, SR. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a storage depot for the calcium ion, right? So very high concentration, very low concentration. Outside the cell, also a very high concentration, right? But we don't need to worry about that because that's not moving. Uh, what we're going to do is release this calcium upon stimulation with an action potential in the skeletal muscle fiber. And so, we have a voltage sensor, and again, you don't need to, know the, know the, need to know the terms here, but that's the dihydropyridine receptor. That's the voltage sensor in the T tubules. It is linked to the, another color here, it is linked to the channel in the uh, SR membrane, which is the ryanidine receptor. Again, don't need to know that terminology, but when that depolarizes the T-tubule, when the action potential depolarizes the T-tubule, we get a linkage there between the voltage sensor to the channel and our calcium will escape. Some of our calcium will escape. And so now intracellular calcium levels will increase. That calcium is the trigger for uh, the generation of tension between our thick and thin filaments. And so down here we have our thick And then thin filaments interdigitating. We have the Z line, which anchors the thin filaments. So thin filaments would go off in this direction as well. Right? That's the Z line. Somewhere over here. Z line. Thin filaments go in the opposite direction. Right, and the sarcomere is z-line to z-line, so we just have more sarcomeres in both directions from this one that we're focused on. Now, um, we do have the thick filament in red, the thin filaments in white, so myosin filament, and then the actin filament, right? The thin is the actin filament. And make sure you can see the bottom here. There we go. And our thick filament has myosin heads on it. Now, normally those myosin heads are not, when the muscle is not stimulated, 
are not attached to the thin filament, not pulling on the thin filament. Right? So they're just sort of sitting there. A couple more here. Right? Oh, and by the way, our thick filaments are stabilized by proteins of the M line. Right? An M line in the middle of the sarcomere, Z lines at the ends. And then of course we want to point out our zone of overlap, right? Where the abbreviate here, O L overlap, right? Where the thick and thin filaments overlap. And we point that out because that's the region in which we generate tension. That's the reason we generate tension, because that's where the cross bridges, the connection between the myosin heads and the thin filament can occur. Now again, they don't occur until calcium is released. Calcium is important because, and I can add a protein sitting on top of our thin filament here in one picture, in one of our thin filaments, that would be the uh, troponin, or sorry, tropomyosin. Right? That's the one that sits in the way of, and I can put one under here in blue. It sits between the thin filament and the myosin head, so it inhibits the cross bridges from forming. Now, when there's no calcium being released in here, that's where it sits. It sits in the way, and we can't form cross bridges, and our muscle is uncontracted. When we get the action potential, and we get the stimulus, and we get the calcium release, the calcium is going to bind to a molecule called troponin. It sits on top of a tropomyosin. So the calcium is going to bind right there. Right? It's going to bind to the troponin. The troponin is linked to the tropomyosin, so it moves the tropomyosin. That's going to happen at all on all these thin filaments, right? Because there's going to be calcium everywhere here. And so we're going to move the tropomyosin off of the thin filament which possesses binding sites for the myosin heads. So now, because of the presence of calcium, our myosin heads can bind, pull, release, bind, pull, release. They, they form cross bridges, which cycle. And as long as you have calcium, and as long as you have ATP present, you will get this continual cycling of billions and billions of these myosin heads forming cross bridges. And what's going to happen is the thick filament is going to pull past the thin filaments in towards the Z lines, like so, right? That means the thin filaments actually will get closer together here, right? We're taking our Z lines and sort of pulling them inward. Repeat that over and over and over in the adjacent uh, sarcomeres along this, remember, lengthwise sequence of sarcomeres that's called a myofibril. Um, but if each one of them shortens and we add it all together, we get significant shortening along the full length of the muscle cell. To get our contraction to go away, we need to, to stop contracting the muscle, we need to have the calcium be removed. It's not done actively, we just reduce its concentration and then it will diffuse off of the troponin, the tropomyosin would slide back into position, inhibiting the cross bridges from forming. So how do we do that? Well, there's a pump that sits here in the SR membrane that is a uh, calcium pump. It's actually called the circa pump, uh, sarcoplasmic slash endoplasmic uh, calcium pump. Um, and it continuously, it continuously pumps calcium in. So it's overwhelmed. The pump is overwhelmed a little bit by release. Calcium levels rise. But as soon as we stop releasing this, as soon as the action potential stop, will stop releasing calcium, and then the pump starts to win, the calcium levels will fall, it'll diffuse off of the, the troponin, the tropomyosin slides back in position uh, on top of the G-actin uh, binding sites for myosin, and then our myosin heads can't uh, attach and pull anymore, and tension, tension will go away. And so what we just talked about there, I'll put a little tiny graph in the middle here, is a stimulus right there, which is our, the arrival of our action potential, and then the action potential generated in the sarcolemmal membrane of the muscle cell. And then we get 
uh, development of tension, right? We can say tension or force, same thing. Um, this is time on our x-axis, and we would get our twitch where we develop tension, then the actual potential uh, re it repolarizes after the actual potential uh, is over, and our calcium release stops, and our calcium is pumped in, and so we would lose tension, and it would come back down to resting tension, and then we're done. We have a twitch. And of course, those twitches can vary in both strength and duration based upon which fiber type we're talking about. Slow twitch fibers or fast twitch fibers. So if this is a fast twitch fiber, a slow twitch fiber on the same graph would be slower to develop tension, slower to lose that tension, but not develop as much tension as the stronger, because it's larger, right? Remember the uh, diameter strength relationship, right? Bigger fibers generate stronger uh, forces, greater tension. Smaller fibers, the type uh, type one slow twitch in yellow here, are weaker and slower. And again, we'll come back to how that relates to differences in power generation as well. Remember, power is the uh, development of force per unit time. So this is developing more force in a shorter time, and so that's a more powerful fiber than the slow twitch fiber. Okay, and we'll talk more about metabolism in an upcoming section.